Yes. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for this invitation, particularly to UNIS, and to the university. And I always like to be in person with people, but since that's not possible now, we'll just do it on the internet. So uh, what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is what is decoloniality? And what connection does it have with coloniality? What are these big words that sometimes uh, even seem hard to say? Uh, what does it mean to do it, to do decoloniality in the classroom, in the university? And finally, what about the idea of decolonizing the university? Is that possible or no? How do we think about it? So those are basically the three questions that I want to engage in today. I hope you will have time for that. So first, let's think a little bit about what is decoloniality. And so uh, if you can see uh, the slide that I put up there, uh, to begin to think about it together, right? So we can't talk about decoloniality without talking about coloniality. So that's why I write the two with a slash in between. First off, I think it's really important to think about both coloniality and decoloniality, not as a theory, not as a new paradigm, not as a new mode of fashion, not as a a competition, who understands coloniality best, who, under, who engages in decoloniality best, who are the best thinkers. Uh, rather, it's a perspective, and that's something that Danilo Quijano, a Peruvian sociologist, argued many, many years ago when he started to use this big word, coloniality, and then decoloniality. He argued, don't think of it as a theory, because oftentimes theory is something that's closed. Right? Yeah. But think about it as a perspective, a way sort of of reading the world, of analyzing the world, of seeing what's going on around, around us, of sensing it, yeah. and using that analysis of perspective not only to better understand the ways that structures of power configure, reconfigure themselves, but also the ways that struggles against that system. So if we think about it as both words, coloniality slash decoloniality, as perspectives, not theories or paradigms, but also as something ongoing. So it's not something of the past, it's not something that, that we can simply describe, but it's continually ongoing, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But it's also both together for tools of analysis. And I think that's really, really key when you think about the context of the university. How do we analyze what's going on around us? What's happening here in the Netherlands? What's happening here in other countries of the region and other parts of the globe? So to understand that this perspective is not singular. There's not one single way of understanding coloniality slash decoloniality, but rather to understand how it takes form in different places, right? But also to understand that in addition to being a tool of analysis, it's also a perspective, yeah, a lived focus of struggle, a struggle that happens all over, including in the universe, including in the context of knowledge. And I will speak a little bit about that in a moment. But also, in thinking about this coloniality slash decoloniality, it's also really important to think about that on one side, it's against, right? So that it's sort of see my arrow here, and it's against the different manifestations of the colonial matrix of power, right? Of the ways that that matrix of power is looked at. So decoloniality means to have a perspective, a protagonism, an action that questions and that struggles against that matrix of power, but at the same time, it's for. And that's really, really key for me. So that it's not just an anti-colonial position, but it's something that constructs something different. Sort of what we might refer to as an otherwise, or something else, something distinct, and that has to do with knowledge, has to do with thought, has to do with sensing the world, being and becoming in the world today, but also living. 
So the issue, and I'll explain a bit about that in a moment, of living is real here. We can't talk about decoloniality or coloniality without thinking about how it impacts us, how it impacts the daily worlds that we live in, the worlds that are around us, and the possibilities, that's the four, of constructing something else, no matter how small that might be. So in that sense, we could say, on one side, on the coloniality side, there is this systemic or systematic matrix or grouping of power that's created, that's reproduced, that's sustained from above. In other words, coloniality is part of what the system constructs, right? Whereas decoloniality happens from below. And so again, there's the notion of the system's doing this, but from below happens other things. So kind of a political, epistemic, existence-based insurgency. Insurgency doesn't necessarily mean going out on the street and, and protesting, it could mean that, but it also means sort of to act upon, right? A propositional, affirmative actions, and attitudes as well, what we might call a decolonial attitude, and from the margins, from the borders, from the fissures, from outside, but also from inside the system and despite the system. So decoloniality says there's something we can do. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to turn over the system, but there are things that we can do. So in that sense, it's important to remember that when we talk about decoloniality or what is decoloniality, always we have to keep in mind what is coloniality, because the two come together. If coloniality began more than 500 plus years ago with the so-called invasion or conquest, in, in what today we call Latin America, the Caribbean, the Americas. But it's taken on different forms. It's ongoing. And so it's not something of the past, it's something of the present, which is important to keep in mind. And so if we turn to the next slide. Yeah, let me just explain a bit more about coloniality. Yeah. So as I was just saying now, if it's something that began in, in the 16th century, and sorry I wrote siglo, sometimes my mind works in Spanish and not in English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, siglo means century in Spanish. Mm -hmm. yeah. So coloniality can best be understood as a logic, right? as a matrix, as I said before of power, that number one takes as key the idea of race, and that's really central. Because oftentimes when we talk about colonialism or colonization, the issue of race is not present. But what happens when we put that into the picture? So how did the idea of race take place? How did it begin to take form? Right? And it took form actually in the processes of colonization or invasion from what today we would call Europe, and you know, what today we would call Spain or Portugal, of Latin America, right? And it began as a way of classification. So this notion of classification on who's on the bottom of the scale, right? And so in the context of, of Latin America, you know, indigenous people and people of African descent are at the very bottom of the scale and it goes up. So mixed people would be a bit higher, what we call mestizo in Spanish, and then white Europeans would be at the top. And so how that system of classification began in one geographic place in the world, but then how it began to travel all over, right? So it works, we could say, this matrix of power, or logic of power, to classify, but also to dominate and to control intersubjectivity and the ways that the different peoples Interact, interact, but also for ways, again, the system, hierarchical system of classification is established. But also the notion of humanity. Who's more human than others? Right? Something that continues today, and we can clearly see it with processes of immigration, migration, refugees, etc. Yeah. But it also marks labor. Who's apt, most apt, most capable for certain kinds of jobs, 
and who is supposedly only capable of service-based jobs, domestic jobs, etc. Of the ways that authority, including the ways that the state, is set up, who governs and who can't govern, how governance is set up, and what about gender and sexuality, and how that gets played out in this classification as well. And of course, key, particularly in the context of universities, it is your knowledge. What, no, what is knowledge? Whose knowledge counts? Who can think and who can't? Who can produce knowledge and who doesn't produce knowledge? Who produces real knowledge? Science? And who produces mm, this other thing that some people might call it? Right? But also think about the ways that different forms of spirituality yeah, play into this and are, are classified as less. And particularly key is the issue of nature. Nature understood not just as resources, that's what happened with these processes of, of colonial processes, but rather as all that exists in the world and how different kinds of beings interact. Right? So coloniality, in a sense, is logic is about life, the way that life is organized, the ways that capitalism plays into that, modernity, Christianity, heteronormativity, heteropatriarchy, etc., and the way it sort of built a Western Eurocentric notion of civilization, who is civilized and who isn't, of rationality, who thinks and who doesn't think, who's more rational than not, and of knowledge of science, but also our world sense and our world view. So that began more than 500 years ago. And how does it take form in a global sense today? So we can think about today, coloniality is global. It's not something of Latin America. It began there now and traveled the world. For today, it's global. So what does this system or systematic model of ongoing power look like here in the Netherlands, in other countries in the region, and other places in the world? And what are the ways that domination, exploitation, classification, and control continue to happen in different ways? So it's important to think about particularly how coloniality works on all the social structures of society, on all of the social institutions, most especially institutions of education, and what about issues of knowledge and education of France, right? Yeah. So to put into context these multiple forms of violence, of dehumanization, of dispossession, of expropriation, of occupation, of epistemicides, of linguicides, of feminicides, of transcides, of islamicides, and what we might call ethno-echocides, all interrelated together. Extermination's and elimination of peoples, of territories, of knowledges, of languages, etc. So if you look here um, at this image, this comes from a cover of a book that was published in 2015 by the Zapatistas in Mexico, a book on what's called the Critical Thought and the Capitalist Hydra. And in recent years, I began to think about the notion of the Hydra and how that really serves to give a visual image of what coloniality is today. Right? So I call it the colonial capitalist Hydra. So it's like this strange animal right, with all these different heads. When you cut off one head, and another head grows. When you cut off another one, and another one appears. And some of them have smiles on their faces. So you think, ah, this is an ally. But isn't that sort of the way that this logic, this global logic of coloniality works? It's so hard to name it. Because it's everywhere, yes. But it does have certain you know, structures, institutions, ways that it interacts. So to think about this global system as a hydra, I think, is really useful. But it also pushes us to begin to analyze it, to say, well, what are those heads? How do they exist here in Amsterdam? How do they exist here in the Netherlands? How do they exist in the region? What are they? How do they change? How do they shift? How do they make us think they're allies when actually they're reproducing, they're re reconfigurating, they're mutating this notion of coloniality over and over? So in that sense, I think it's important to think about you know, what decoloniality can mean if we think about it in 
and as praxis, right? So again, not just as not just as this sort of abstract perspective, but what does it mean to actually think about doing decolonial work, right? Okay. Understanding that decoloniality has always been a method of struggle. Struggle in communities, struggles on the street, struggles in universities, struggles against state, against social institutions, questioning the ways that this matrix of power happens, right? So think about the different contexts that it happens, the ways that it's relational, it's the way that it's based and lived, but also the ways that it's intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and existentially and territorially woven. The way that it happens here in the Netherlands is not the same way as it happens, for example, in Ecuador. Yeah. But there are points of similarity, and that's why the importance of analysis. Right? So to think about it as both political, epistemic, and existence-based, yeah, as sort of a propositional attitude and offensive, the challenges, but that also constructs. Yeah. As an analytical perspective, and can say before what, that permits us to theorize, not just to talk about theory, but to theorize as an action, as a, 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 as a verb and not just a noun. Yeah. To also so assume a socio-political standpoint, but also to think about decoloniality as a pedagogical and method methodological stats. How we do this, how we do it in the classroom, how we do it in our writing, how we do it in our research, how we do it in our homes, how we do it on the street, in the communities, whatever. Okay? But also to, to think about it as a way to think from and with and not study about. And I'll mention that again in a moment. So to think about decoloniality as a process, as a practice, as a pedagogy, but also a proposition of struggle against and at the same time for or in otherwise, a way of knowing, of thinking, existing, living, and that helps us begin to think about constructing hope. Yeah, hope in small letters, not in big letters. Hope in these times where there's a lot of hopelessness in different places in the world. But how do we open some fissures or cracks to make, to make something different despite the system that we're in, despite the university we're in, despite the social structures we're in? And to think about this hope under conditions, with conditions, building conditions of decolonial. And I think that's really key. So decoloniality, again, is not this box that we can simply describe and, and, and get there. But in this ongoing way, how do we plant it? How do we grow it? How do we cultivate it? How do we understand that as we begin to advance, so too, coloniality doesn't stop. So it's an ongoing way an ongoing kind of question. So in that sense, we can begin to think about the decolonial hows. Yeah. In recent years, for me, yeah, this is the center when I think about and what I attempt to do, to write about, to talk about, to practice decoloniality. I always keep in mind the issue of the how or the hows, the hows in plural. Because the hows push us to do something, not just to describe what it is. Like, what is decolonial? How do we do decolonial? How do we do decolonial? And I think that's the real challenge, and that's the real impetus to begin to think differently. So obviously, there's a huge list that we can begin to make and think together about how we might do it in academic practice or praxis. But here I just included a few to think about. So, for example, how do we challenge the precepts of research and methodology in the universe? The issue of objectivity, of neutrality, of distance, of certainty, right? You're not supposed to question. When you do a dissertation, when you do a a monograph or an essay for a professor, right? You're supposed to be certain about what you're arguing about and not question that. You're supposed to be objective, right? Not get involved, take distance, be neutral, not show the perspective. 
but also you have to make you visible yourself. That's what research and methodology typically does. As we know, in academia, you're not supposed to write I. You're supposed to somehow erase yourself. My argument is you can't do decoding the work making yourself absent or invisible. So you have to think about, write about, talk about your own perspective, your own complicities, your own involvement. But also an I, we. So it's not just I, 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 I. But how do I think with others, right? How do I understand that I don't exist alone, but I exist in the world with others? And so maintaining that issue of I, we is particularly important, right? And also extractivisms. So research and methodology typically extract, right? It's a form of epistemic extractivism. We take away, then we publish under our name, and it never goes back to the community that we study, right? Or if it goes back, it goes back in some form that makes no sense at all. So questioning, challenging those, thinking about what are the other ways, how do we fissure or crack those, those requirements that the university puts to begin to do something about how do we think from and with, and not just study about? So we know, in most cases, research, field research means studying about, right? Well, what does it mean when we have to think with or from those contexts? And how do we make that part of our own research, our own writing, right? To not make ourselves absent. How do we shift who we read and how we read, right, in classes? And this is important as well to work faculty members or professors. How do you form a syllabus? The typical way is here's the canon of what students have to learn, and then if there's time at the end, maybe we'll look at some local authors or writers. What happens when we shift that? When we begin to destabilize the existing practices of knowledge, of theorization, and conceptualization, and we read differently, we choose who to read differently. What does it mean to assume an ongoing collective process of decolonial questioning analysis continually in the classroom, in our own research and methodologies and, and work, right? To question, to question, to question, and not necessarily have the certainty of answers. And how do we make present our own positionalities, our own complicities with coloniality, and recognizing the work that needs to also get done within? Right? So we can't challenge, we can't question decolonial structures that we also don't work within. And understand the colonial difference, right? That difference that emerges from that logic or matrix of colonial power is differentially embodied. It's differentially situated and experienced. There's not just one way of understanding colonial differences, multiple ways. And how do we put that into conversation? How do we give space as well? to those outcries and in-cries that we have, those things that oftentimes we go, we're afraid to say, or those pains or wounds that are inside, how do we begin to have spaces for those to come out? One of the things that I often do in my classes is I ask students to write letters. They can write letters to me, they can write letters to a friend, to themselves, to an ancestor, uh, to some imaginary person. But sometimes letters permit us to say things that typically would never come out if we wrote an essay or a monograph or a final paper for a student or anything else. And finally, what does it mean to open and widen the cracks and fissures, right? To think that we're not going to necessarily look for over change or change the subject matter that we're in, the university that we're in, but we can open some cracks and fissures. What do those look like? How do we begin to crack? the practices of classroom, of university study, of university work. That, for me, is part of what we can understand as thinking about the hows of decolonial work and academic practice and practices, right? To begin to sow some seeds that are different and to understand that those seeds, which are part of this, go with the students, begin to move with the wind and go in other places. Some may sprout, Others may not. But to think of decolonial work as that way. What happens in the classroom, how do we plant those seeds so that students, that we all, including faculty members, take with us those elements, right? So finally, 
And I think it's important to think what the cracks mean, right? Okay, what are the pedagogies and methodologies? And then often link those two together. Because for me, a methodology is a pedagogy. It's a way of doing. It's not transmitting. It's a way of doing. And what does it mean to open those kinds of facts? And to see the possibilities of measures. So to understand uh, uh, the work in the classroom, the work in the university, as not just this totalizing system, but maybe as a crack in the wall that begins to flower or sprout something different. So finally, uh, so that's sort of my image of the cracks, uh, 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 of the something different of the seed that can begin to burst out and crack the concrete, but also the possibilities of flowering, of blooming, something different. And that's the hope, although small. That's something that we can do, that we can do individually, that we can do collectively, that we can do in the classroom environment, we can do amongst collectives of students, of faculty, of people concerned with the system that we're struggling against. And so finally, one final thought here. What does it mean to decolonize the university? And this image comes from South Africa. And the struggles of students there to decolonize the university, the institution, thinking first from the curriculum. So the processes of decolonization of the university in South Africa are exemplary because they happen from the world. So as I said before, we can't think about decoloniality or decolonizing the world as something that happens from above. As the institution says, oh yes, we're going to decolonize. Oh yes, we're a decolonial institution. There are institutions that say that, but I haven't seen one as an institution that really does that. Decoloniality doesn't happen from above. It's not a policy that one puts on the institution. It happens from below. And so what happens when students, as has been the case in South Africa, begin to question the curriculum, begin to say the knowledge, the texts, the authors that we're reading have nothing to do with that reality. How do we shift that? That doesn't mean we throw away the Eurocentric canon, but we also start from where we are. What are the knowledges that exist on the territory that we're living, that we're part of? And then how do we put those maybe eventually, in conversation or debate or dialogue, with knowledge that come from other places. So the processes of decolonizing the university, as an institution, one could say, probably will never happen, because the institution is part of a colonial system. Right? It's part of the system of capitalism, coloniality, patriarchy, etc., all intertwined. However, we can't open these visions in practice. And that's part of the work of the decolonizing of the institution, right? And, and again, a verb, an action of something of doing. And so the processes that have taken place in South Africa and that are taking place in other places in the world are extremely important. When they are processes that happen from below, when they happen from students, from maybe a few faculty members, because it's hard to think about a whole university faculty, beginning to look at what it means to decolonize the university. But groups, small collectives of faculty that come together and think about it, and particularly faculty that work with and from students, because I think that's the issue. Students have the power to begin to question what works and what doesn't work in the system, and how do we begin to change that? And how do we change it in a sense that begins to get at and this base of knowledge that has very little to do with it? the lived reality of the interview, and how to begin to construct something else. And so curriculum, what we study, how we study, who we read, how we read, is all part of that. So I think those are important issues to think about when we talk about the possibility, the work to be done in decolonizing the university. What are the spaces in the university that are spaces thought for students, and particularly for students of color? In white institutions, like many in the Netherlands and other places in Europe, how do we begin to fissure or break that? How do we create other spaces where the knowledges aren't just the knowledges of the canon 
particularly white male uh, heterosexual thinking canon. Yeah, and we begin to construct something else. Those are things we can do. Those are processes that have to do with decoloniality in as practices. So while there's much more we could say for this short knowledge clip, I think that puts some issues into debate and conversation. And I hope it's useful for all of you that are listening to begin to begin your own debates here in this university and in other universities in the region. So thank you.